Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision, philosophy help define our contemporary world. The story of my guest today is the remarkable one of a local boy making good and dreaming the great dream of India's mission to the moon. My guest is the chairman of the Indian Space Research Organization, secretary of the Department of Space and chairman of the Space Commission. I'm delighted to welcome Mr. G. Madhavan Nair. Welcome, Mr. Nair. Thank you. Why the moon? Quite literally, dreaming the dream of the moon. Well, I think uh, men always were fascinated by the beauty of the moon. And uh, looking from far away distance, we don't get much details. Now, there's a lot of enthusiasm to find out what kind of minerals are there, what kind of uh, resources like helium or rare gases are there which can be potentially tapped for the future. But you know, the Americans have been to the moon, they brought back samples. Why, is, why do we spend so much time and money and energy? The initial the... programs were mostly prestigious programs. They wanted to land a man on the moon, they did that. Also, they brought out some samples, but they were very limited. We don't have information about the polar region, the mineral content in the whole surface, and how the terrain looks like. So what we are targeting is uh, to map the entire lunar surface and to f get the features, the surface contents, and whether look for water resources even. So this is going to be a potential resource for the future, uh, especially if we come across helium-3. It's a, a high energy fuel which can be used for fission reactions. So in what tangible ways uh, do you think it might uh, help us, other than this larger sort of romance of the moon and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, naturally adding to the reservoir of knowledge? If we tap one ton of helium-3 from there, it will survive for 10 years of energy requirement for the country. So we'll have to first see whether the helium-3 is there in abundance and whether it can be economically tapped. So we would like to follow it up with some sort of a rovers which can go down and uh, uh, get these features. Then later we are talking about uh, interplanetary travel. This can become a base. We can send the hardware, rockets, hardware, fuel, etc. And of course, if we can find water, it can be dissociated to hydrogen and oxygen, which can become the uh, natural input for the interplanetary So problems. are we thinking of a man on the moon by when? Uh, right <laughs> now, we don't have <laughs> such a plan. In fact, we believe the instrumented approach to look at uh, these things are far more economical than trying to send a man up there. So our cameras and uh, X-ray detectors are very powerful, and they can do much more precise work than a human being in such orbit. And it is uh, at least one-tenth uh, less expensive compared to a manned mission. So we will concentrate on uh, unmanned missions now. You know, a lot of uh, the space programs have been motivated by prestige. You know, China has a man in space. Uh, is the Indian space program somewhat being left behind, you think? Uh, I don't fully agree with that. Uh, as you rightly said, it is more like a prestige issue. Whereas the scientific content, the technical content-wise, our program is far ahead. Uh, our communication or the remote sensing applications is the world's first. And uh, we are really bringing the research to the common man using such space technology. Whereas if you said the person is for a day's event and he comes back. But uh, what about the capacity building, the technology that goes into it, the sense of national pride and confidence uh, that uh, that yields? Well, the next generation launch vehicle, GSLV Mar 3, what is in the design process, it will be in about five years we'll be making it. That launch vehicle can put about 10 ton into low Earth orbit. That is much more than what is required for a manned capsule. Then there are a host of new technologies to be developed life support system and uh, how to provide the proper uh, living conditions for the human being, etc. So that remains a lot of uh, resources. In fact, uh, our entire planned budget will have to be spent on such a program if we want to embark on that. Uh, on the other hand, we are trying to wet our hands how to bring back from orbit to ground. Next year, we are going to have what is called a spacecraft recovery experiment, by which a spacecraft will be orbited. One, min one month it will be there in the orbit. Later, it will be brought down and we will recover. So we will have the technological capability in the next four to five years for such missions with us. I should add that uh, you, know, you have a, a commercial division uh, in Bangalore. Uh, what, are the, what are the achievements? What have you been able to, what are the spin-offs uh, from the space program that you have tangibly been able to market? Uh, well, mainly the space products is what is being marketed by the Antrix. We have now the images which is uh, taken from the IRA satellite. It is sold uh, globally. And we have roughly about 15% uh, of the global market is uh, with us now. 
And then of course there are some of the components and subsystems developed for the spacecraft. They are sold to uh, European countries and Japan and uh, things like that. So we are slowly getting to the market. Uh, another niche area is the launch services itself. Uh, we have already launched four small spacecraft for uh, countries like uh, Germany, Belgium and Korea. And also we are trying to see whether larger launches can be cornered and hope in the next couple of years we will get into the launch business as well. Do you think that uh, the shift in the sense that you come uh, from a background in, in, in launch vehicles uh, and, and many of your predecessors had backgrounds in satellites is going to mark some kind of change in, 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 in the emphasis or a consolidation uh, of, of, of effort in ISRO? Uh, ESO's programs are well chalked out and we have normally a long-term plan. Uh, we, in fact, recently only we have cast our next 10 years profile and that profile has got an equal mix of spacecraft, launch vehicle and applications. So that way it is not going to make any dramatic uh, difference in our strategy or the policies. And also I had opportunity to work with the earlier leaders like Professor Rao and Dr. Kasur Rangan and even the founding father Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. So I have learned quite a lot of uh, things from them and I'm sure I'll be able to meaningfully utilize for the progress of the space in the country. The great vision of, uh, of Dr. Sarabhai and the predecessors you mentioned, Mr. Katsuri Rangan and, and Mr. Rao, uh, was really the use of, uh, use of uh, space applications uh, and, and not just the prestige element that we were talking about. What do you think have been some of the most significant applications of space technology uh, for India and, and the impact that it's made? In the recent years, what we have achieved is in the telemedicine. The major uh, specialty hospitals in the metros, they are getting connected to the rural areas, the mountainous regions and the islands. And that way the far from places, the expert medical services being made available. More than about 50 such hospitals are connected to 12 specialty teams in the country. Uh, starting at uh, Bangalore to Northeast and uh, Delhi to Andamans, Nicobar, etc. Other area is uh, education to reach the villagers through a community programs. The tele-education we are giving a thrust. Of course, recently there is a lot of uh, talk about uh, having, not having sufficient uh, teachers, experienced teachers. So we are trying to connect even the leading institutions in the engineering or medical with the other less privileged institutions through the tele-education. Tele how how much of this is, is uniquely Indian? These are sort of fairly universal applications of space. Uh, wouldn't it have been perhaps you know, cheaper and easier for us to simply buy this off the shelf from other parts of the world instead of the investment in developing uh, the, 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 the technology ourselves? We have to see the context in which the development took place. In the mid-70s, that is where we started this business. At the time, I don't think there was any global player who was willing to invest money and demonstrate such things. In fact, uh, the central India, 2,000 villages getting connected to the satellite for the tele-education program. That was a very unique experiment and today even claimed as the world's first and the best. We have built upon that. It is local specific. The programs which has to develop, the contents which has to go with that and etc. That has to be created locally. In addition, we have to be cost effective. There are service providers, but it is prohibitively expensive and a country like ours cannot afford. So that way we brought out the systems of low cost and the techniques which meets the local conditions. So that way they are unique and uh, I don't think there is any comparable systems available in the world market today. What you see is the web-based education. There are limitations in the bandwidth, the connectivity and the type of interaction which you can have. We are going to have virtual classrooms. Uh, there's a, if there is a good uh, mathematics teacher in a school, his class will be available to at least 50 schools nearby. So that's the type of concepts we are trying to bring in. You're watching a conversation with G. Madhavan Nair, Chairman of ISRO. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back to my conversation with G. Madhavan Nair, Chairman of ISRO. Uh, in terms of the, 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 the global uh, campaign, process, effort, striving, programs uh, related to space, um, where do you see this Headed. We've had, uh, uh, you know, the disaster with the, um, the discovery, the shuttle, um, and uh, there is some sort of concern about whether it's too much of an indulgence sending men to Mars. That seems to be the next dream. What would be your dream for the global uh, space program? Uh, well, we would definitely continue to have exploit in the space technology to meet the common man's needs. That is from the low Earth orbit as well as in the geostationary orbit. 
we can have the earth observation techniques, the communication techniques and the application projects which come out of that, whether it is in the medical, education, disaster management, agriculture, forestry, etc. There is a host of common man's needs can be met with that. In the country, we are going to concentrate on as the first thing. Second objective is to have a low cost access to space. So today roughly about $20,000 per kg is the cost of sending a spacecraft. In fact, in India, we have succeeded to have about $15,000 to $17,000. And we would like to target less than $10,000 a kg in about five years from now. The new generation launch vehicle system is going to be that. Next, uh, space transportation system in terms of recoverable and reusable system. You mentioned about the uh, space shuttle accident. It is one of the very complex and expensive vehicle systems which is available today. And that is not the right thing for the future. We would like to make something uh, near equivalent of an aircraft which can be used at least 100 times in a cost effective manner and make ultimately maybe something like $1,000 a kg to orbit, a cost effective means of accessing. Then of course the space science which goes with that. We have to understand quite a bit about the planetary systems, the galaxies and beyond. So this will form one part of our program and as uh, beginning we are going to moon and then trying to explore. So that will have, as I mentioned earlier, the resource survey in the lunar surface and also throw some light as to the evolution of the planet Earth and how the moon came in and how the galaxy spun off. How the Isn't there a, a, a larger impulse than the purely utilitarian that also drives uh, the space program? You know, curiosity, is there life out there? which may not have immediate short-term gain for us, but it is a larger spirit of mankind reaching out beyond the planet. Absolutely. We, uh, there are definitely our scientific community is very much enthused by looking at the stars and the galaxies and then trying to explore the mysteries of the universe. So to that, the space uh, the capsules and the props become very powerful tool, and we would help, like to help them in this process. Do you think there is uh, life on Mars? And what might be the implications, both emotionally and psychologically and, 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 and in scientific terms, if we were to conclude, yes, there had been life in Mars, if there isn't any now? Well, I think the, for the indications, there was a water resource, there was an atmosphere, and the temperature conditions were conducive at one time. Perhaps at those conditions, the life forms could have existed. But today, the martial atmosphere is very, very poisonous, and there is no water trace left in the surface, and the temperature extremes are very high. So that all indicates uh, the life forms cannot sustain beyond this. So this may be perhaps a lesson to us. We are, we are getting into the global warming and uh, pollution in the atmosphere and things like that. And if we exploit our resources very uh, drastically, perhaps uh, in years to come, we may also end up with such an uh, extinction. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that there might be sort of life forms in, in, in other parts of uh, the galaxies, the, the universe, um, space? But I would like to imagine it like that, but uh, there is no uh, evidence to show that such things exist. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you talk about the galaxies and uh, there can be something equivalent of a solar system much beyond our reach, and perhaps uh, some forms of life could exist. But I don't think we have uh, the humanity today could not establish any contact with any such forms. How might you react? How do you think uh, mankind might react uh, if it were to actually conclusively uh, find some evidence from uh, outer space that there was life or a, or, or, or a message or, or, or something of, of that nature. What would it do to you? Well, I think it would be terribly exp exciting and we would like to exploit how we can cooperate and hold hands with the, such uh, beings outside and uh, perhaps uh, spread our civilization beyond Earth. You're watching my conversation with G. Madhavan Nair, Chairman of ISRO, Chairman of the Space Commission and Secretary of the Department of Space. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Your own sort of uh, you know, education at the Government Engineering College in Trivandrum and rising to the apex uh, of the uh, Space Research Organization uh, is the testimony to the quality of our education that you really haven't had foreign education in that sense, which is so largely uh, treasured and, and, and valued now. Uh, in, 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 do you have you felt in some ways limited by the fact that you don't have a foreign degree, a PhD, the stamp? Well, I think I believe that uh, the process of education is a continuing one. I left the college in uh, '66, but since then, the type of topics which I was exposed to and the opportunity which I had to learn is quite vast. Uh, I think I could go through the entire garment of technologies associated with rocketry, whether you talk about the propulsion, aerodynamics, controls, navigation, and avionics, and whatnot. So that has enriched my knowledge base. 
and uh, my colleagues working with them and then trying to do experiment and learning from experiments that all has added to the value and I'm confident that I have sufficient knowledge base to face mm -hmm. such things. Mm -hmm. How much of your work uh, still involves being a, a scientist or stroke engineer? Uh, well, in ISRO, we cannot uh, subdelegate the scientific decision making tasks. Most of our projects demand uh, newer, uh, newer technologies to be developed and demonstrated. In that process, I have to interact with the scientific teams, whether it is in the application or the space science or in the rocketry and in the spacecraft building. All these areas we have interactive discussions and decision making process. So I spend almost about 60% of my time in such activities. Do you sort of find the, some of your other responsibilities as uh, secretary in, in, in the government of India uh, to be sort of inhibiting this, 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 this flow and the surrender to science? Well, we are working within the government system, but at the same time I get fantastic support from the government. And that way we ensure that whatever needs to be done to meet the government regulations are met on one side. At the same time, the free and uh, frank atmosphere for the R&D is maintained within our organizations. Mm -hmm. So it is a really uh, sort of a balancing act mm -hmm. between the such two requirements. You know, many scientists, uh, particularly those who look at uh, space and, and, and astronomy and the stars, uh, begin, to, begin to develop a, a, a respect, shall we say, for, for, for a well, supernatural, a guiding energy, a force, call it God, call it what you will. And in India, we, we seem to have sometimes an, you know, an amazing apparent dichotomy that uh, somebody who's trained in the empirical sciences you know, also is, is, is a believer in something that transcends that. What about you? Well, um, you go on searching answers for many things, but quite often we get stuck. We may not be explained how and why of many things then you tend to believe there is something beyond and the supernatural powers, etc. And of course, one gives the form of a god, name it, whatever you call it. But I believe there is uh, something which is beyond us, which uh, shapes the destiny and uh, results of not only human beings, but organizations as well. You know, a great deal uh, in India is done at you know, auspicious times and by checking the calendar. To, uh, you know, for uh, Rahu Kalam or, you know, whatever variations there are on a good day an astrologer is con uh, consulted. Does that ever influence decision making at ISRO? Do you look for a good, good day to launch a, a, a satellite? Not exactly. I, I think because our series of events which lead to a particular launch time mm -hmm. and that has to be met. But at the same time, sometimes a large group we are working with and some personal sentiments are there, we will try to respect to the extent possible but not going by such superstitions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, in, in what ways have you found working with ISRO and working with space uh, has had an impact on you personally in terms of your own evolution, in terms of your own change? You did, you did a degree in engineering. Uh, you know, some aspects of uh, uh, a job in engineering can be quite prosaic and mundane, and here you're dreaming about a mission to the moon. Well, I think uh, I had a very unique opportunity in my career the Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, who was the founding father of the program, uh, he had a great vision of things to happen. And in fact, that has influenced me greatly. Then later, I think my, the first assignment was uh, with uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, our professor, president. And uh, in fact, uh, the many of the managerial techniques I learned from him. Then, of course, uh, I had the exposure of working with uh, leading scientists like Professor Dhawan, Professor Rao, Dr. Rangan, etc. Uh, I think I could learn quite a lot technically as well as managerially. And perhaps I can say that I could uh, take the best of the world and uh, the experience of such a vast uh, uh, personality, uh, great personalities, and that has really helped me in shaping up a style for my own. Tell us about uh, you know working for a boss who's now the boss of India in a sense, the president of India. What was he like as a boss? He was a fantastic uh, team builder. He used to tap the uh, capabilities of even the least uh, capable person and then exploit for the common cause of a project. In fact, the first SL with the rocket was made by him. And he has a habit of uh, passing on the credit to you and taking on the blames on himself. There's a unique characteristics and uh, the way he has built up the teams, the built up the technology and the institutions, it is remarkable. You know, the, the Space Research Organization has, shall we say, public dreams and declared goals. Do you have a private dream for yourself and for the program? Well, as I mentioned to you, uh, the giving an outline for recovery around reusable launch vehicle, 
that will be the dream which I would like to put it on motion and should become a reality in about 10 to 15 years from now. And when you are ready to retire from uh, ISRO, uh, what, what would you want people to have said about your tenure? One, I think I must establish uh, credibly on the application side. Uh, the, most of the funds which is spent for the space program should be benefiting the people at the grassroots, especially targeting the villagers and the common man. Mr. Nair, thank you very much. That's been a great privilege. Thank you very much. It's nice you, talking sir. to you.